So in this section, I want to explain to you two-dimensional convolution and motivate it with um, a 2D imaging example from positron emission tomography. So just to introduce then PET or positron emission tomography, and I will cover the very basics of acquisition of data and then back projection of that data because this gives us a really clear understanding of two-dimensional convolution. So the very basics of PET involve administration of a radio, radio tracer um, to the bloodstream of a patient or subject under study here. And this gets taken up in various tissues, um, including being taken up in the brain. And because this radio tracer is uh, a positron emitting compound, what will happen is that uh, the positrons that are emitted will annihilate with electrons and we get back to back high energy photon pairs, each of 511 keV each. So those are energetic enough uh, most of the time to escape from the brain and to then be detected in this ring of detectors that uh, constitutes the, the PET scanner. So these are high density crystals designed to stop high energy photons. And then when we uh, acquire that data, we would then go about uh, reconstructing from that data. And what I'm about to show you is even simpler than reconstruction. We're just going to back project um, those detected photons uh, to try and figure out where that annihilation event, where that positron and electron uh, annihilated. So that will become clear in the following slides. So this is the situation. We've got a field of view um, inside the PET scanner, and we've got a radio tracer distribution in there emitting back-to-back high-energy photons that are being detected by this um, high-density crystal ring, basically. So there I'm showing those back-to-back -back photon pairs, just giving a few examples being emitted there. And we detect them on what we call lines of response. And then in PET, we're, we're saying that we'd want to reconstruct the object that was inside the field of view. Um, and so that would be actually an example of a, of a 4D discrete function f um, of the three spatial independent variables x, y, z, and uh, the uh, independent variable of time. Um, but what we're going to do in the next few slides is just uh, do a simple guess of that object just by back projecting the PET data. So what does that look like? Well, we'll keep it simple to start with. Um, and we'll just go drop back to a 2D example of just um, some radioactive concentration F as a function of X and Y spatial independent variables. And we're just gonna have a point source emitter located there. And so as we know, uh, that will be giving off back-to-back -back photon pairs and what I'm showing here is just one example from the many isotropically emitted photon pairs that will come off from that point source of the positron emitting compound. And of course, this would be inside the brain somewhere. I'm just showing one single point. Um, that would be detected by the ring of detectors that surround this black box field of view. And so I'm saying we detect a, detector D1 and detector D2. And then what we can do is get a separate empty array in a computer memory and just um, knowing the coordinates of detector D1 and the coordinates of detector D2, we can just draw a line to connect those two points. Because if we've only detected two photons in those positions and if we haven't me measured the time difference, if we're not doing time of flight, then our best guess is that it came from somewhere, that that point emission uh, came from somewhere on that line. And this is called a back projected image, hopefully for obvious reasons, we're just back projecting along the line, um, the line of response where we detected um, those two photons. And so I'm gonna call that back projected image G of X and Y, because clearly it's not the same as the, the actual point source F of X and Y. So if you like, this is gonna be our input function for the PET scanner. And this is going to be the output function, which, as we'll see, will build up to be a convolved um, output. 
So let's look at a, another um, event from that point source. And so I've just shown a different angle of emission of two photons coming off from that point source emitter. They get detected by two different detectors with different positions. And so I can do a, a similar stage of back projecting according to the coordinates of D3 and the coordinates of D4 and draw a line between those two coordinates. If we get a third positron emission with back-to-back -back photons being emitted, uh, we could have such a line as that. And then we can again back project in that back projected image. And you can see that they're already nicely intersecting to show us where that point source emitter was. And if we're only imaging a single point source, this would, this would obviously be quite a viable way of, of trying to recover the, the location of a point source. But often we're interested in far more complicated distributions. Um, so after six back-to-back um, -back photon pairs and back projecting, we can now see that we've got six lines intersecting in this back projected image. And then after 1,000 back-to-back photon pairs, we begin to see that we're getting this nice pattern, this point spread function that is appearing now in this g of x, y output image. And so we can see that a point source has been replaced by a point spread function in the back projected image. And uh, because this is a very special case, uh, we're going to label that response as the point spread function and give it a function name h, the kernel, the point spread function h, as a function of x and y. Now normally for the point spread function to be more practical, uh, we'd have the point source in the middle of the field of view so that we can um, have this response in the middle of the field of view and get as many of the tails as possible because obviously this is spreading from minus infinity to plus infinity, or at least for the dimensions of the, of the matrix. But you get the idea that a point source has been replaced by a point spread function in the back projected image. And so already um, this is building up a, a picture of what convolution is doing, because we just notice there's this substitution proce process going on. Point source has been replaced by a point spread function. So therefore, as we build up complexity in our 2D image, so now we've got multiple point sources inside the, the scanner field of view, and we can do exactly the same process that I just illustrated for the case of one point source. And now we'll get, after say 5,000 such back projections from all of those 11 or so point sources, you can see that we'll get lots of different um, point spread functions. But the point to note is, with this geometry, they are all the same shape. They are just differently positioned. In fact, they're positioned in direct correspondence to the position of each point source. Okay, so again, note the simple model. Each point source has been replaced by a point spread function. And if we carried on back projecting, then, I mean, you can see some of the lines in that back projected image, but if we did a lot more, say a million such back projections, you would just notice this very smooth, beautiful one over R response function, the point spread function, located at each position of each of the point sources in the um, function f of x, y. Um, and then we can continue to build complexity. So imagine now we had this distribution inside the PET scanner field of view. We've got a circle, two point sources, a square and a line. And the point to notice is that these objects can be regarded as collections of delta functions or collections of points, of point sources. So we know by what we've just demonstrated, that each point source gets replaced by a point spread function. Now, of course, if each point is greater intensity or greater amplitude, then the response function is of correspondingly greater amplitude or greater intensity. Um, and so that is all that's gone on in producing this back projected image, except here I've only used 60,000 back projected events. And so again, you can still see the lines. But if I carried on doing more and more back projections, this would all look very smooth. And what we'd have is just a direct substitution process. Every single point in f of x, y would have been replaced by a point spread function. And if the amplitude is greater, 
in f of xy, then the amplitude would be correspondingly great, greater in the g of xy. But of course, they're all summed together and they're all overlapping. And so that's why you might notice here that these um, two point sources and the circle and the square and, and the line, in fact, you can see that it looks like the circle and the square are, are greater intensity than the line, whereas the reality was the line was greater intensity compared to the, the circle and the square. So all of this overlapping of all of these response functions can give you a very non-quantitative image, and so it can only really be used to represent where things are. But the point of this slide is to show you all that's happening with two-dimensional convolution. It's a direct substitutionary process. So then when we get to an even more complicated distribution, such as a slice through a brain here, this is still a collection of point sources of different amplitudes, whereby each point source of a given amplitude has been replaced by its point spread function of corresponding amplitude in the back projected image. Now here with 100,000 events, um, I've still, I'm still limited by finite counts, and so you can see the lines. But again, this would normally be quite a smooth function if I carried on for millions of events. Okay, so what is that mathematically? Well, um, let's see if this will respond here. So we've got the back projected image g of xy, and this is what we've seen in an earlier slide. Okay, that's just the collection of point spread functions. And we're saying that to get that, you need to look at the, um, the true um, distribution, the input function f, and then you need to consider the, the point spread function, h of x, y. And to get the output, all we do is, as you can see here, we've got summations over l and k, because um, these are the, um, okay, so it's, I guess it's k, l, corresponding to the x direction and the y direction. All we do is just visit the function fxy at each of these test locations k and l. So k will give us the position uh, along the x-axis. L will give us the position along the y-axis. So I guess we'd start at the bottom left corner. So we'd, we'd go along k here, and then we'd go up to l plus 1 to get the next row and keep scanning and keep scanning. And all of the values down here would be zeros, okay? There are no, no point sources here. So that means there'll be no corresponding output there. But when we get to this location here, whatever the KL coordinates are of that point source, then this tells us, ah, when we plug that K and L in, then we get now an actual value of the function F, and we use that as a coefficient or a scaling factor for the point spread function H of X, Y, but shifted to position K and L. So we take H of X, Y, and we position it exactly where that point source is, and then that gives us the output at g of x, y. And all we do is just carry on that same systematic process of visiting all the locations in the input function f of x, y, and that's why we use those dummy indices k and l to just mark where we are as we carry on in this visiting process trying to scan across the entire function. And for every scan position, we just look at the function value and then take that as a weighting factor for a point spread function centered at that very position. And then we just sum up all the results for all of the point sources, and that gives us the back projected image output, which is just the convolution of F with H. And uh, there is a, a whole uh, word derivation for convolution, but I'm just describing to you the mathematics. You can look up the Latin uh, origins of convolution if you like, and I think it's derived from, um, it means to roll um, with or something like that, and it means you're kind of just um, scanning this kernel basically across the input function. Okay, so to review then, um, I've just given you a motivating 2D imaging example to explain two-dimensional convolution using the simple example of positron emission tomography. In reality, of course, we don't back project for clinical data. We'd actually use a reconstruction algorithm and we'd be working in 3D. But um, just to explain some concepts, I've reduced PET to 2D and just back projected to show that that can be modeled by convolution. And as we'll see later on, uh, it is important for convolution to hold for that response function to be the same wherever those point sources are. And in 3D, that wouldn't be the case, but for 2D, it is the case, hence my use of this example. Thank you.